Good morning, church family. My name is Jeremy Mikulak. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome you if you are here for the first time or if you're new here. Um, we're so thankful that you're here to worship with us, and it's just good to see everyone here um, together. And um, as we were singing, a lot of the songs that we chose to sing this morning were about God's goodness. And as we'll see in the text today in Revelation, that God is good even when there's pain and suffering. And um, as we know, we're going to continue to study in Revelation. And so if you don't have a Bible this morning, um, we're happy to, to give you a Bible. If you just want to put your hand up, we'd be happy to give you a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible for yourself, please let this be a gift from us to you and for you to keep so that you can study God's Word. We believe that the Bible isn't just black ink on white pages. We believe that it's the living Jesus, and we believe that it's God's inspired word to us that we can know and truly know God through his word that he's speaking to us today. And so as we study the book of Revelation, what we see is that our king, Jesus, is coming back. He is coming back. Do you believe that? And I know, you know, for, for some of you, you might just be jumping in. And so we've gone through a lot with Revelation. There's a lot that's been happening as we've been studying the book of Revelation. So kind of just to review quickly um, and concisely, what we know is that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was crucified, was buried, was resurrected, and ascended to the Father. One day he's going to return to earth. And when he returns, he's coming to judge sinners, to destroy the wicked, to set up his kingdom on earth, over which he will rule as king of kings and lord of lords. And so we, as individuals, and as the body of believers, we play a part in his plan and his mission for the world as we rule with him. In chapter 19, what we'll see next week is the return of Christ. And in chapters 20 to 22, kind of describes what happens after Christ's return. And then in chapters 6 to 18, leading up to today, what we see is that it kind of gives us the conditions of the world. The judgment of sinners. Christ is setting up his kingdom. And in the midst of all this, we've seen judgments on the earth. Seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl judgments, that God has been pouring out his judgment on earth. And in the midst of all this, an antichrist has come and started to build his kingdom with the power of Satan and the false prophet. And so as we've been studying through these different chapters of Revelation, we've kind of talked about different interpretations, different views of the tribulation and of these end times. And for some, we believe that as a preterist view, we believe that these things have already happened before the return of Christ. Then there's a view where it's an idealist view, where it's not limited to the future, but it could be happening through the church age. And then there's a futuristic view where these things are yet to come. And so I personally, I hold to a futuristic view that the tribulation is a literal seven-year period that begins with a rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about that we'll be called up to meet the Lord in the air. In the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so as the body of Christ, we will not be present during the tribulation period. And that's the view that I take. However, what we do see throughout the book of Revelation is that there are believers present. People preaching the word of God. We see that there are Christians that are being persecuted, that are dealing with all that's happening on the earth. And as the Antichrist gains power, he's now built a city called Babylon. And so in the book of Revelation chapter 18, we'll read about the destruction of this city. And some say that this city is symbolic, that it's a world state, and others, like myself, it could possibly be a literal rebuilding of the city of Babylon. And so as we kind of take a look through this, I don't want that to be our focus this morning, but I want us to think about how God is destroying the city, what is happening in the city, and the state, and the characteristics of why God's destroying the city. And there is a lot of applications for us as believers here 
and there, as there were applications for the readers who read it thousands of years ago. And so let's get right into it. In chapter 18, you can turn the Bible to chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated from his glory. He cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The kings of the earth have committed acts of sexual immorality with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich from the excessive wealth of her luxury. Now, as we read just in these first couple of verses in chapter 18, what we see, another angel coming down, another messenger of God coming down from heaven. The earth was illuminated from her glory. It could suggest that maybe this angel just came out of the presence of God. As we see in the Old Testament, when Noah met with God, his face glowed. Perhaps it's also talking about the state of the world where we saw some of the judgments on the earth were darkness. And so out of the darkness, we hear a voice crying out, fallen, fallen, the repeat of this word fallen, talking about the guaranteed and soon to be quick and swift judgment on Babylon, on this city, full of demons. The spiritual state of this city is so dark and demonic that it brings about this judgment in verse 3, it talks about how all the nations have partaken in what the city has to offer. That we know that God's plan is not just for us as individuals, but for all tribes, tongues, and nations to worship him. And through this city, all of these nations have become corrupt. And part of that judgment, I believe, is because of their influence for all the nations, that God has a heart for all nations, and he will judge because of the sin's influence. Now, we also see the different kinds of immorality that's taking place in the city, just as a glimpse. It doesn't take us long as we live in this world, some of the things that the immorality that's taking place, some of the things that are being taught, some of the things that are being accepted by our culture, that God's design for mankind is through one man and one woman to be married, that he ordained marriage between one man and one woman, that there are genders. There's not a spectrum or continuum of genders. And within some of these sins committed it's important where God stands and where we understand where God stands so that we can stand with him in this world and culture. But we can see how quickly the devil can plant seeds in people's hearts. Truth can be twisted and distorted. And so we lose sight of what is true. It becomes confusing even for little children growing up, not sure what gender they are. What is marriage, the sanctity of life, and all of these things? And so with God's swift judgment of Babylon, we see some of the characteristics of the sin that's taking place from the city. However, what we also see in verse 3 that I want us to focus on is not just the immorality, but the profit that's being made through the immorality. Church, there are many temptations for us in this world. God's purpose for us is not to just be called out of this world, but to be in it, to live with him, to be shining like a light in this dark world, like this angel. And yet, when we speak out, sometimes what we're speaking into is the darkness. And it doesn't take long, like I mentioned, for us to start to face the different sexual temptations. And for our culture, it seems like with a lot of the sexual temptations and the immorality that's present, they justify it by 
this is a business. We're making profit. And for many people, they are benefiting from the sexual immorality that's happening in our day and age today through pornography, through social media, through commercials, through different businesses. And so as parents, it's important that through all of these things that are being taught, like I mentioned, we are here in this world, that's important for us as parents to have conversations with our children, to have dialogue with them, to teach them what's right, to have a biblical worldview, that we're not called to just be isolated and we'll, we'll continue to talk through what that looks like for us today. So let's continue to read in verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive any of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her offenses. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give her back her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her, to the extent that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. To the same extent, give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow. I will never see mourning. For this reason, in one hour, her plagues will come, plague and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her is strong. Church, what we see here is that there are believers in the city. God's people are in the city. What we also see through all, the whole Bible and the story of redemption is that God is a God who saves, that he is a God that delivers his people. And he's continuing to do so even here amidst this judgment that he's going to pour out on Babylon. This other voice, it could certainly be Christ as he talks about coming out of my people or it could be another angel. But as we think about this, the sin so piled high, it seems like there's a reference to Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel where the people had one language, one common goal, and they were building a tower as high as heaven. And here the tower is sin. And God has remembered her offenses. Church, that's something encouraging to us, that God remembers the wicked. That if God is faithful and just to judge the sins of the wicked, he is faithful and just to forgive those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, who have paid for our sins. And so to be paid back double this word double, it means complete, that God is going to give them exactly what they deserved according to their sins. We see in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 40 and chapter 61 as well, that God even poured out judgment on his own people, Israel. And it mentions this phrase that he poured out double according to what they deserved. And so as this, this cup that he talks about is going to be mixed, it's going to be complete. But it says in verse 7, to the extent that she glorified herself full of pride, but full of luxury, to the same extent, torment and mourning. It kind of gives the same idea of the ancient Babylon talking about the queen and their pride saying, I am not a widow, I won't see mourning. But it's not by their will, but God's will and his plan for the city through their superiority, their luxury, their self-sufficiency, that God is going to bring about a quick and swift judgment. In verse 8, it talks about this phrase, one day her plagues will come. We'll see that again in verse 10, in verse 17, and in verse 19. Because our God judges her with strength. He is strong to judge. Where there's people, there's sin. But where there's sin, there is hope in Christ. And so church, in verse 4, when he talks about the call to come out, to come out of this city, Babylon, before he pours judgment down upon this city, 
I can't help but think about us as believers. That in this text, it's talking about the physical to leave, to flee, to get out of this city before he punishes the city for their sin. But spiritually for us as well, oftentimes when we are in this world, we are tempted and we become like the world. But we're called to be a light, to not look like everyone else. And so the way that we spend our time, the way that we spend our money, the way that we are tempted to live in luxury, we can often become so comfortable with the everyday that we forget about why we're here. And so God has called us to be a witness, to proclaim his word to the end of time, to persevere in the faith. But for us, it's so easy sometimes to sit back and to be comfortable, to not stand for what's true. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about the warning of falling into idolatry by being yoked with unbelievers, having these partnerships, these relationships with others that don't have the same worldview. They're not transformed. And so there's warnings to his people, to the church, to be careful. Watch out for your interests, your desires, the hobbies that you have, how you spend your time with others. And in Romans 12, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So for us today, sometimes, as we're thinking about coming out of this world, we can tend to kind of go to one side and think to just isolate ourselves, to live in our Christian community, or to try to protect as much as we can. And there are good things about that. There are things that we need to to think through as we're raising our children in this world that we need to protect them from. But at the same time, God has not called us to be isolated. And there's not a balance between the time that we spend in the world and being isolated from the world. What we see throughout Scripture is that we are ought to be transformed. We need to have a new mindset. It's not about trying to find a balance between the two of how much time we spend with the world and without the world, but to have a whole new mindset being transformed, seeing every time that we are with people as an opportunity, whether they're Christians or whether they're not, as an opportunity to be a witness, to proclaim and to stand for truth. In John 17, even Christ prays for his disciples and he prays for believers. He says, God, please, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That we are here to be persevering in the faith. Now in verse 9, we're going to see three different Classes of people that are going to be mourning over the destruction of Babylon. We're going to see rulers and kings, merchants, people who are profiting, people who are selling and buying goods. And lastly, we're going to see shipmasters, people who are distributing goods throughout the city, throughout the world. So let's read in verse 9. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of sexual immorality and lived luxuriously with her will weep and mourn over her. When we see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your, ju- your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every article of ivory, every article made from very valuable wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, perfume, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, cargo of horses, carriages, slaves, and human lives. The fruit you long for has left you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and people will no longer find them. 
The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city. She who is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. And every shipmaster, every passenger and sailor, and all who make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city is like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich from her prosperity, for in one hour she has been laid waste. You see, all three of these groups are mourning not just over the destruction of Babylon, but did you see why? Because no one buys their cargo anymore. Because they have no profit. Church, what causes us to mourn? The things that we cry about is a, reveals our hearts. Not just the things that we celebrate, but also the things that we cry about and the things that we complain about the things that we're loud about reveals our heart. And for the people here, they're much more wrapped up in their own profit and luxury than they are of human lives, of their own sin. What we see here some of the goods that are listed as we go through the long list and it ends with human lives and slaves. What we know to be true even in our day and age is that human trafficking is the second largest illegal industry. It's the fastest growing industry. Billions, hundreds of billions of dollars being poured into this industry. And even just within the top three nations that are partaking and benefiting from this, the Philippines, Mexico, and the United States of America is the top country. You see, all throughout history, the world, people have devalued other people, distorting the truth about being made in the image of God trying to find a way to push others down, to degrade the value of humans. Whether it's through sexual industry or racism or hatred for other people, whatever it might be, all throughout human history we see slavery and injustice. Even as we prayed for Afghanistan, what we're hearing even here is this sex trade, human trafficking, people being sold. And for us to hear that, sometimes it's hard for us to even comprehend and to think, how can I help prevent this from happening? How can I stand for the truth? How can I be called out of this world and stand against these sins? The things that we participate in are all wrapped up in it as well. The things that our world benefits from, that we need to be careful, Christians, because there are things that we are tempted of living in a city of sin. The things that we look at on our phones is all part of the industry of human trafficking. The inappropriate images. So church... Be careful what we're listening to. Be careful of the TV shows that we so love to watch. Be careful of what we read. Be careful of isolating ourselves because we're afraid of what other people might think. That there are sins that we dig ourselves so deeply into that it feels like there's no escape. But there is hope. And I hope that there would be a revival in our churches that would set aside those things, that would love their spouses and be committed to 
the purity and the sanctity of marriage, raising up their families in purity and seeking God for all of those things. But what we see here is so full of the luxury, being tempted and deceived and deceiving all nations around the world because other people are profiting from their businesses. And so God is bringing judgment. Evil will have its day. And in verse 20, we as God's people can rejoice. We can rejoice knowing that evil will have its day, that there will be a time when God judges the sin of the people. Verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. That we can rejoice because of God's goodness. That God hates sin. But what we know is that God, he loves people and he does not want to see anyone perish. But there will be a time when God judges and destroys evil. Verse 21. Then a strong angel picked up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. The sound harpists, musicians, and flute players, the trumpeters, will never be heard in you again. No craftsman of any craft will ever be found in you again. The sound of a mill will never be heard in you again. And the light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the groom and bride will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the powerful people of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your witchcraft. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slaughtered on earth. You see, throughout this time, there was a great persecution of saints. And it's still happening here today. Many believers who are being persecuted for their faith, losing their life because they are standing in the name of Jesus, But church, I want to finish and I want to close because I really believe that a lot of these characteristics of what we see in this city of Babylon are temptations for us. In Matthew chapter 13, even Jesus talks about the temptation of riches and pleasures, that those things can be choking out our faith that the sower who brought out the seeds, who was preaching God's word, the people who heard God's word, but those seeds were choked out by life's riches and pleasures, resulting in no fruit and no maturity. For us, how has our luxury, our comfortability, influenced our spiritual life? The church, we need to be careful that we're not so caught up and what's easy, what's comfortable. But we stand for what's true. That for many of us, we do live in a luxury, and it's not wrong for us to have money or possessions, but God calls us to a high standard. What we do with those possessions, what we do with our money, what we do with our luxuries reflects the heart that we have, and our faith that we have in Christ. And so as these people are so caught up in the city, these people are so caught up in their luxuries that they forget about what's important. They lose sight of human life and human dignity. And I think it's easy for us when we read this to point fingers at the world and to think, I'm not like that. That the sins that these people are committing These aren't the same sins that I'm tempted to commit. But I think it's important for us to take this as a warning for us as well as believers because in this context in the city, there were believers in the city participating in the same exact sins of the people of Babylon. So may we come out of the sin that this world has to offer. May God convict us deeply this week of the way that we spend our time, our finances, the way that we rely on our luxury and our comfortability, that we rely on Christ alone, 
for those things to provide for us. Church, will you close with prayer with me? Lord, we, we just pray that as we seek this text, as we see your judgment fall on Babylon, Lord, we pray that, that we would be like you, that we would shine bright in this dark world, that there's many sins among us, temptations, the evil one calling us to fall away from faith. And so, Lord, we pray that as we stand, that we stand firm in the faith that we might face persecution for what we believe. We might be seen as crazy for the way that we act, the, fa- the way that we spend our money, the way that we push away luxury for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of helping others. And so, Lord, we pray that we wouldn't wrap ourselves up in our luxury or remain comfortable if it costs us our faith. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us convict us of those things that we might not even realize. Seek our hearts and and find the, the things in our hearts, Lord, that we're protecting, keeping away from you. We pray that you would change us and make us more like your son, Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a a great week this week, and God bless you.